Hello, my name's Ephraim Aaron. I'm an immunology consultant based in Southampton, and I'm going to give a short presentation on recognizing eosinophilic esophagitis in the clinic. So when considering eosinophilic esophagitis, it's worth bearing in mind risk factors. ATP is a well-recognized risk factor, and most of my patients have some form of ATP, whether it's mild hay fever uh, to grass or tree pollen through to the other end of the spectrum with severe asthma, eczema and hay fever. Um, yeah, I've even got some patients who don't report any allergies at all, but when you skin test them, they're positive and that may indicate that they're sensitized but not allergic. This increase in ATP associated with sound effects of is probably linked with the way the immune system is skewed to what's called a TH2 response. And this immune response um, is geared towards dealing with parasitic disease, but in our current environment where parasites aren't an issue, it's an inappropriate response that leads to ATP, allergy, eczema, and asthma. We've looked at the genetics, and lots of studies have looked at the genetics of uh, eosinophilic esophagitis to highlight genes that may be relevant. And a lot of these genes are involved in this TH2 immune response. Other interesting features are male predominance. So we see in more, more males and females with a three to one ratio, and that's for both children and adults. We see a family history um, in some patients with eosinophilic esophagitis, and that's also worth bearing in mind. And that's probably linked to both environmental factors, and a lot of the environmental factors are also associated environmental factors with um, A to P and allergy, which is interesting. What's also interesting is when you look at the instance of eosinophilic esophagitis, it is going up exponentially. A lot of studies looking at this, particularly in Europe, North America, um, has shown that. And what's also demonstrated is, is that seems to parallel the increased incidence of, of A to P and allergy, and they seem to go hand in hand. So in patients with eosinophilic esophagitis, um, a lot of the symptoms relate to problems, discomfort with the esophagus. Uh, and these include dysphagia, or when they swallow, it's pa a painful process. Um, sometimes the food gets stuck and they can't clear it. They may try and clear it by vomiting, but it doesn't get removed, and that's called a food bolus obstruction. Um, and also symptoms such as reflux. Um, in the younger patients, particularly, there may be problems with eating, so food refusal, uh, difficulty with meals, difficulty with we weaning, particularly in the younger children, which I'll focus on later. So these symptoms are specific to a problem with the esophagus itself. But there are some more general symptoms too, um, such as chest pain, um, when, the, when the food is stuck in the esophagus or going down very slowly, the muscles contract quite fiercely, and that can be quite painful. Um, vomiting may be a feature, and non-specific abdominal pain as well. If you look at patients who are investigated for these symptoms, um, and you look at the incidence of eosinophilic esophagitis, um, there's some interesting data. So in those with a food impaction who have an endoscopy and biopsy, nearly 50% have a diagnosis of eosinophilic esophagitis. With dysphagia, it's a bit lower, it's about 23%, and that accounts for other conditions um, more often associated with dysphagia. And the non-specific symptoms, there's a, a lower yield, so non-cardiac chest pain and abnormal pain, it's about 6% when you endoscopy them and biopsy them, where you see eosinophilic esophagitis. Eosinophilic esophagitis affects all age groups, both adults, uh, teenagers, young children, even infants. The way they present really is dependent on their age, their ability to express um, their, their pain and their discomfort and their symptoms. And often that does, that does vary with age. In infants, it may simply be just food aversion, vomiting, regurgitation, um, choking during meals, and it's often the care and parents that observe these changes uh, and they'll raise their concerns with, with healthcare professionals to have this investigated. Sleep disturbance, particularly in infants and young children, is well recognized in eosinophilic esophagitis, and that's thought to be due to the pain and discomfort not just being during eating, but being prolonged and affecting sleep. Infants and toddlers then move on to children and they also develop symptoms. They may start to be able to report dysphagia. Um, and also food impaction and the discomfort with that that would raise awareness with, with parents and the carers. Other things such as choking, regurgitation, abdominal chest pain may be symptoms as well. 
they may complain of throat pain. And it's interesting, a lot of patients, particularly adult patients, when you ask them where the discomfort is, they'll quite often point towards the upper area, the throat and the upper esophagus. Um, the problem is it's like may not be there and there have been studies where they've inserted a balloon into the esophagus and inflated the lower esophagus and asked the patient where the discomfort is and they'll say it's in the upper esophagus. And that's because the nerves, the innervation that senses these things is not as specific as in the skin. But often they will report upper, upper pain and discomfort. Um, children also may have sleep disturbance and, and nausea. As we move to adolescence, the symptoms are very similar to adults. And the main features of dysphagia, so complaining of difficulty and discomfort while eating. They may have described having had food impactions before. Not all patients with food impactions go to hospital. Um, and I've had lots of patients say what happens is they'll have the impaction, they'll go to the bathroom and try and vomit it clear, and sometimes that happens. Uh, they're able to clear it, but but if they can't, then they go to a hospital. Um, but the big problem is they won't go on and report it to a healthcare professional to get this diagnosed uh, and they just sort of deal with it and live with it. So patients with eosinophilic esophagitis tend to modify what they do to, to compensate for the symptoms, the pain, the dysphagia when they, when they eat. This comprises a number of things. So a lot of patients will say that they need to drink fluids with their meals and that helps washes the food down and alleviate the discomfort. They'll eat more slowly. It'll take longer for them to finish their meals. They'll be a bit choosy about what they eat. So they'll avoid meats and steaks and stodgy foods like, like breads. Um, they'll chew more slowly and it'll often, they'll often say they're the last person to finish a meal. Um, and they'll take smaller bites. Some patients also um, will avoid going to eat out because they may not have as much control over what they eat and often they're worried about what will happen if the food impacts because it can be quite embarrassing having to go to the toilet to try and vomit and clear the food. The problem is that patients modify what they do and because of that their symptoms aren't so bad so they don't go to seek medical help or get this investigated and that does delay diagnosis. This is important because if you leave it too long the eosinophilic inflammation can cause scar tissue or fibrosis and that will narrow the esophagus and that won't go away unless it's treated with an invasive procedure which is a book called a balloon dilatation that we really want to avoid if it's diagnosed early less than two years from onset of symptoms the risk of this structure formation is quite low it's about 17 percent if you leave it for too long let's say 20 years that goes up a huge amount to over 70 percent and i certainly have a number of patients who just uh dealt with their disease, modified what they've done, and diagnosis has been quite late. And quite often these patients, it's not until they have a food bolus obstruction where they can't clear it that they go to the emergency department and following on from that is diagnosed. Another important feature is that symptoms don't correlate well with disease activity. I've had a number of patients in clinic who've said they feel well, they have no dysphagia whatsoever, but when you investigate the inflammation is relatively high and that makes it very difficult certainly difficult to monitor response to treatment, but also may be a feature that, that results in delayed diagnosis because if they're not having symptoms despite inflammation, they're not going to seek help uh, and a diagnosis won't be made. So in patients with eosinophilic esophagitis, um, there are other diseases to consider and probably the most common one is gastroesophageal reflux disease. There are some differences between the two, although you must note that you do get reflux in patients with EOE. Uh, not all patients, as some have the two together. So how do you discriminate the two? Well, certainly in patients with eosinophilic esophagitis, the main complaint is dysphagia, so pain on swallowing foods. In reflux, however, the main problem is more heartburn and regurgitation. Food impactions are very rare in reflux, but relatively common in eosinophilic esophagitis, and that can be a key discriminator. You, may, you will see a male predominance, as I said before, in EOE, but in reflux, it tends to be equal male to female. There are associated conditions such as atopy. So as I said, atopy is very common in patients with syndiflex esophagitis, but you don't see that increase in atopy in patients with reflux disease. So what other conditions do you need to consider in patients who have problems swallowing or dysphagia? Well, the differential diagnosis is quite broad. 
and it is influenced by the age of the patient. Various conditions, neurological conditions, central nervous system conditions can actually affect the way the nerves work and control the muscle contractions. The muscles themselves could be abnormal and not working properly and all of these features will affect the way food goes down and symptoms of uh, dysphagia or other symptoms of EOE. Infections can do it um, and, and, and other conditions that may develop later in life such as connective tissue diseases, vasculitis um, may also be relevant. Although gastroesophageal reflux is by far the commonest. If you're investigating a patient for dysphagia and you have a biopsy and you see ES infills on biopsy, there's also a differential diagnosis. Reflux is probably the commonest cause for this, but all these conditions such as inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's disease, connected tissue disease, some medication, vasculitis and infections can all give you an eosinophilia. As a general rule, if the eosinophil count is high, so it's greater than 15 or 20 per high power field, these other conditions are much less likely and eosinophilitis of phytitis should be top of the, the list of causes. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Nirmala Gonsalves, Professor of Medicine at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine in Chicago, Illinois. I'll be walking you through the program Diagnosing Eosinophilic Esophagitis. It's important to recognize that eosinophilic esophagitis is a clinical pathologic diagnosis. Patients should have clinical symptoms as well as abnormal histology. Therefore, the use of endoscopy and histology in the workup is very important. When we think about endoscopy and who to perform endoscopy on, we think about adults with dysphagia or food bolus impaction or patients with refractory heartburn or atypical chest pain. Children with EOE have typical symptoms of decreased appetite, food refusal, abdominal pain, or even dysphagia and needing to chew their foods very finely. These are just some of the symptoms that alert us to the diagnosis of EOE. EOE is ultimately diagnosed based on endoscopy with histology. So if you have patients with these symptoms, it's important to proceed with the upper endoscopy. Now the gold standard of diagnosis is to obtain tissue for histology. So at endoscopy, it's important either when you have a normal esophagus or abnormal features, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, to obtain esophageal biopsies. Now we know that EOE is a very patchy disease. So in a normal appearing esophagus with these characteristic clinical symptoms, we recommend taking at least six to eight biopsies along the length of the esophagus. My own clinical practice is to take four quadrant biopsies in the proximal and distal esophagus and put them in different jars in order to achieve that sensitivity. Now, when you have abnormal endoscopic features as demonstrated by the endoscopic tool ERAS, it's important to target your esophageal biopsies with those features. For instance, if patients have edema or exudates, it's important to take those biopsies at those locations. Again, taking at least six to eight biopsies along the length of that esophagus. Now, if a patient has a stricture or a narrowing in that esophagus, that's when you would proceed with an esophageal dilation to help improve that stenosis. Now, once we take the biopsies, the next important part of diagnosis is to send those biopsies to the pathologist so they can look and make that diagnosis based on histology. And with histology, they're looking for the characteristic increase in the number of eosinophils. And that is a typical count of more than 15 eosinophils per high power field in that esophageal mucosa. If you have more than 15 eosinophils or high power field in that esophageal mucosa, that is consistent with the diagnosis of EOE. If we don't have that many eosinophils in that mucosa, then we start thinking about other etiologies for esophageal eosinophilia, either primary or secondary. Now, common endoscopic features are described based on the endoscopic reporting tool, the EREF score. I'll walk you through the components of the EREF score. Each feature is graded, and it's a very helpful tool to use when you do your endoscopy so you know if that endoscopic change is improving with therapy. So with edema, patients may have a grade of zero, which is just a normal vascular pattern. You can see those blood vessels coursing through the esophagus. 
When you lose that vascular pattern and have decreased or absent vascularity, that gets a score of one. Now, concentric rings are graded as absent, a score of zero, mild, which are just visible when you fully insufflate the esophagus, and that's a one, moderate, where they, these ridges are visible even without insufflation, and it allows the passage of an adult endoscope. That's a grade of two. And it is characterized as severe if there is the inability to pass that adult endoscope, and that suggests that that stricture is less than nine millimeters in diameter, and that is a score of three. The next E is white exudates, and that is graded by absent in zero. They can be mild where the white exudates are less than 10% of the circumference of that esophageal surface, and that's graded as one. It can be severe where the exudates are more than 10% of that esophageal surface, and that's a grade of two. When we look at linear furrows or longitudinal furrows, they are graded on a score of zero to two, absent being zero, mild, so just a little bit of indentation in that mucosa is one, and a very deep or prominent indentation is two. Now, strictures are pretty easy. They're graded as just absent or present. So when you do your endoscopy, it's important to include the EREF score at each point that you're doing the endoscopy. So that gives you another clue as to how patients are doing with treatment. Now, the prevalence of these endoscopic findings certainly vary by age. We think of younger patients or pediatric patients having more of the inflammatory phenotypes, which include the edema and the exudates and the furrows. And as they get older and become adolescents and adults, they get more of that fibrotic phenotype where you start seeing more concentric rings and strictures. The next important component in diagnosing EOE is the histopathologic finding. Now, one of the first are those eosinophils, which are those pink bilobed nuclei cells, which typically are in the top part of the biopsy specimen. That includes and is described by superficial layering of the eosinophils. Once they count a high-powered field, and there's more than 15 eosinophils in a high-powered field, that makes the diagnosis of EOE. Other features that can be seen include microabscesses, which are clusters of more than four eosinophils in a group, eosinophilic degranulation, where those eosinophils break apart and you can actually see the granules in the tissue, subepithelial fibrosis, basal cell hyperplasia can also be seen in EOE, as well as prominent dilated intracellular spaces with disruption of those tight junctions. That is a feature of swelling or edema in that tissue. The first thing that I always counsel on is to examine the esophagus very closely before advancing the scope into the stomach. It's very important to look at that esophagus initially, both from the cricofringes all the way down to that squamous columnar junction and doing that in a very slow manner. It's important to fully insufflate that esophagus to perform evaluation of those endoscopic features because some of those endoscopic features that I mentioned in that EREF grading score can be quite subtle. And if you go through that esophagus too quickly, you can miss those features. So really taking time to accurately assess the esophagus. Now, it's most important to obtain those esophageal biopsies anywhere from five to six at an absolute minimum along the length of the esophagus. So at least from two different anatomical sites, we typically will do those four quadrant biopsies and the distal esophagus. Again, four quadrant biopsies in the proximal esophagus. If you have abnormal features, such as the exudates, the furrows, the rings, really working to target those areas. And then using good biopsy technique. So good biopsy technique includes putting out those biopsy forceps, turning the biopsy forceps into the wall of the esophagus, applying a little bit of tap on that suction to pull and draw in that mucosa before closing the biopsy forceps around that mucosa. That will allow you to get deeper biopsies, which will help the pathologist in making this diagnosis. It's important to really examine the esophagus before doing endoscopic dilation. And I always advise doing dilation before endoscopy. So in patients with established 
strictures, we're going to proceed with a endoscopic dilation. It's important to do the dilation before the biopsies because when you're doing a good dilation, you want to make sure you're breaking apart that stricture and you see some blood when you break apart that stricture. If you've taken biopsies ahead of time, you might see blood and it might be a little confusing. So I always advocate to take biopsies after a dilation if you're doing a dilation. Now, when is it important to obtain these biopsies? Really all patients with endoscopic signs of EOV, all patients with symptoms of EOE, such as dysphagia or food impaction, even if they have a normal appearing esophagus. It's also very important during the time of an endoscopy with at the time of the food impaction to take biopsies at that time in a patient without a known diagnosis of EOE because more than 50% of patients presenting with a food bolus impaction may indeed have EOE. So one question that always comes up is endoscopy can be invasive and expensive, and are there potential options for non-invasive or minimally invasive tools for diagnosing and monitoring EOE in the clinic? Well, certainly it's exciting that there are other non-invasive or minimally invasive tests that are being developed. The first are biomarkers. For instance, an absolute eosinophil count in the blood and serum, plasma tests and eosinophilic byproducts such as CLC, ECP, EDN, eotaxin-3, and MBP-1, as well as markers in the urine such as OPM. Also, the eosinophilic diagnostic panel or EDP has been looked at. Now, while these are being developed, they're not yet ready for prime time, the presence of concomitant ATPs can make it difficult to identify specific biomarkers. So we're not yet at the point on being able to use biomarkers to follow disease activity. What about other techniques to assess that esophageal inflammation? There have been three minimally invasive techniques that have been looked at. The esophageal string test. The esophageal string test is a little capsule that patients swallow. There's a little string that is housed in that capsule. Patients will swallow that capsule down. It'll sit in the esophagus for an hour. It's removed out of that esophagus and sent to the lab, and there's an eosinophil score that's provided. The second is a cytosponge also housed in a capsule. Patients will swallow that cytosponge down. That will ultimately get removed from the esophagus and sent off for similar assessment. The last thing is a unsedated transnasal endoscopy. It is placed into the patient's nose and down the esophagus. It can visualize the esophagus as well as take biopsies. These are promising for assessing inflammation without the use of standard endoscopy. There have been some recent publications looking at these tools following patients after dietary therapy. So I suspect we'll hear more about these tools moving forward. What about other functional imaging? There is a test called a tethered confocal microscopy, which is being developed that potentially has some promise in looking at some disease activity. The endoluminal functional luminal imaging probe or endoflip is a device that's done at the time of the endoscopy. It is a catheter-based tool with a balloon at the end, which can give us readings on both the compliance, the diameter, and the motility of the esophagus. It can help identify different phenotypes of eosinophilic disease and esophageal mechanics in patients with EOE. Now, it's important to recognize that endoflip should not be used to diagnose EOE but may have a role in severity assessment and therapeutic monitoring. I do think non-invasive and minimally invasive testing is a rapid area of investigation, and we'll hear much more about these types of tests in the future. My name is Dr. Jamal Hyatt. I'm, I am a consultant gastroenterologist at St. George's University of London in the United Kingdom. So at the moment, the current treatment paradigm starts off in eosinophilic esophagitis by giving uh, patients the choice of either dietary exclusions, um, acid suppression with proton pump inhibitors, or topical steroid therapy. 
to the esophagus. And this uh, can be effective um, in the majority of patients, um, with particularly with steroid therapies. The problem with PPI therapy, of course, is that it may result in clinical improvement without histological improvement. So long term, this may result in, in symptom uh, breakthrough um, after a period of time. Um, the overall treatment goals are to improve clinical symptoms, resolution of esophageal um, histological inflammation, um, endoscopic appearances, and therefore to improve quality of life and allow patients to eat and drink more normally. However, there are some instances where these treatments um, either have side effects, there may be breakthrough symptoms, in which case we do have a need and a requirement for further medical therapies to treat esophagitis. And this is where biological therapy comes in. Um, and the only licensed treatment for EOE at the moment in regards to biological therapy is with um, dipolima. Eosinophilic esophagitis starts off um, as a food allergy or aeroallergen derived inflammatory condition, uh, which localizes on the esophagus. The immune pathway starts off with epithelial derived cytokines such as TSLP, interleukin 25, and interleukin 33. And with the activation of Th2 cells, there is also a cascade of different cytokines which are involved, including IL 4, IL 13, um, and IL 5. And by blocking different parts of this um, inflammatory cascade, it is thought that um, this can result in both clinical and histological improvements um, to patients with eosinophilic esophagitis. Um, therefore, there are a number of different molecules over the years which um, have been um, tried um, in patients with eosinophilic esophagitis. Um, first, starting off with the anti-interleukin-5 monoclonal antibodies, um, such as mepolizumab, rosalizumab, and benralizumab. And what was found in that in these particular uh, biological medications, they were really good at reducing um, the eosinophilic inflammation. Um, but unfortunately, with time, um, they didn't have a significant improvement um, to patient symptoms um, over the, this period of time. And hence, um, they have not been... Um, demonstrated to be clinically effective enough in patients with eosinophilic esophagitis. However, there are certain patients which did meet their primary endpoints of both clinical and histological remission. And Sindacumab, which has completed um, phase two trial in 99 patients, it's now undergoing phase three trials. Um, Etrasimod, which is a small molecule, and currently undergoing is um, tezapelumab, which is anti-TSLP molecule. So what we have found that from the latest data on the efficacy of certain biological therapies, that with sindacumab, which was shown in 99 patients um, with using an IV loading dose followed by weekly subcutaneous injections, and so there was a significant um, improvement in both histological inflammation and dysphagia. And in this particular patient cohort, these were mainly steroid refractory patients. So it's found that in those patients who are refractory to prior treatments, there may be benefit from switching or even adding in certain other biological molecules to gain particular clinical and histological remission. And so while this is a biologic, etrasimod is a small molecule which has been shown in very initial phase two data to also be effective in both clinical and histological remission. Um, so most of these trials do tend to use patients who have already had previous treatments, whether it's dietary therapy, PPI or steroid treatments as well. So the Liberty EOE TREAT trial, which was a phase three trial in Diplomab versus placebo, was divided into three parts. Part A was the initial 24-week part of the trial, looking at both histological and clinical remission with uh, placebo compared to weekly injections of Diplomab. And these were patients who were... Uh, mm. Approximately 56% of patients had already had um, steroids, and of those... Half of those were um, steroid refractory. What they demonstrated that there was a significant uh, reduction in both clinical and histological um, remission. Um, so 60% of patients had histological remission compared to only 5% of placebo. And this is also demonstrating a significant uh, uh, symptomatic improvement measured by the DSQ in these patients. Part C trial was where this was extended 
from part A um, to up to 52 weeks. And what was found was that there was a significant maintenance of this um, histological and clinical remission at this period of time when um, maintaining on diplomab uh, uh, on a weekly basis. Part B of the trial was where patients were given a diplomab every two weeks and on the maintenance stage of this, um, whilst there was a histological uh, remission, the, the symptomatic improvement was not statistically significant compared to placebo at this period of time. So far, um, most of the trials have actually resulted in, in pretty good safety profiles. Um, certainly one thing is that there wasn't an increased risk of uh, significant infections despite having biological therapy. Um, of course, these are not would not be given in patients with active parasitic infections. If we look here at the safety profile for sendacumab, um, there was um, an increased risk of adverse events on the 360 milligram group. And with the most common side effects being headaches, upper respiratory tract infections, arthrosia, um, nasopharyngitis, as well as in certain cases, diarrhea as well. Um, in diplimab, the most common um, side effects were in particular local um, injection site reactions and erythema, sometimes some injection site pain, and also rather nonspecific symptoms such as nasopharyngitis. Um, in the trial, there was one patient who was hospitalized um, with um, an asthma exacerbation. But overall, the safety profile has been demonstrated to be quite uh, reasonable. The number of different aspects where we need to modify the treatment, the current treatment paradigm for ears and effects of giitis. Um, the current treatment paradigm relies on either dietary exclusions or oral medications, such as with um, acid suppression with PPI therapy and topical steroid therapy, which both have their benefits and disadvantages. Uh, for example, with PPI therapy, um, whilst this can result in symptomatic improvements, there is only a 50% histological remission for these patients. Therefore, the concern is that uh, long-term maintenance therapy is probably not effective for the majority of patients who do have PPI therapy. And even with topical steroid therapy, uh, whilst this has been shown to be um, effective in both the short and medium and long term, um, this isn't always the case for every patient. And certain patients don't like or are not very good at taking therapies consistently. So there is an issue of um, long term adherence. Um, and even for the long term efficacy going on to um, several years, um, there is perhaps the need for further treatment di directions. And one of the benefits about um, certain biological therapy is the need for not necessarily having all medications, perhaps having an injection once a week or every two weeks or even a month, once every month. Um, and this will prov provide some benefit for those particular patients who um, have adherence issues or even side effects for the currently available oral medication which we use. Um, and also for those patients who have perhaps multiple other allergic or atopic conditions where um, systemic biological therapy de derived not just at eosinophic vagitis, but also other conditions such as asthma and atomic dermatitis, um, having a particular biological treatment, which can encompass all of these different aspects, um, certainly we've seen very advantageous in the long term, particularly if there's good long term safety data. Um, and this may vary from time to time. For example, at the moment, we don't have access to diplomab in the United Kingdom, whereas it is the only licensed treatment in the United States. Um, and so therefore, there is certain variabilities um, internationally in what can be uh, prescribed and also um, the need for further agents 